morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Welcome to those in the audience, but also those who are watching us via video. We have about seven or eight hospitals throughout Kentucky who uh, can come tune in to uh, listen to uh, our wonderful speaker today, who's one of our own, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the non-cancer specialists and the role in cancer control. So that's, that's going to be really exciting. On this day, I want to remind you guys that we no longer sign on up front as a faculty. We actually go to the phone and through an app or through a certain website and knowing that number that is uh, in front here, you actually uh, get documentation that you participated here so that you can obtain CMEs at the end of the year. And, and that's going to be important and we're still learning how to do this, but most people are now getting used to it and working it well. On this day, we remember Jean-Baptiste Boilant. And he was a phys uh, French physician who was born on this day in 1796, 1796. And he's well known because he discovered the localization of the speech center in the left hemisphere of the brain. So remember Jean Baptiste Boylan. And in 1932, on this day, was the death of Sir Ronald Ross, who was the first British Nobel Prize winner. And he obtained that in 1902. And why? Because there had been this theory that some diseases like malaria were passed around by mosquitoes, that mosquitoes were the vector, really, for malaria. And he actually described that. He found that in the gut of the mosquito Anopheles, he found malaria. And for that, he was the winner of the Nobel Prize uh, in 1902. But intriguing uh, to me was the fact that on this day, Anton Lavoisier, in 1774, you remember Anton Lavoisier, people talk about him as, as the discoverer and describer of oxygen. And you will be wrong. And the reason was that Anton Lavoisier, on this day in 1774, conducted an experiment where he heated mercuric oxide. And that is a well-known reaction that releases oxygen. He called that breathing air, it's something that people could breathe. Uh, and one year later, in 1775, he announced to the Academy of Science in Paris that he had isolated a component of air that he called eminently breathable air. But he never published any of that. And his text in his notebooks, there was never a discussion of the evolution of gas generation. And people forget that about a year earlier, Carl Skeel actually did the same reaction and wrote it on his notebooks. And Joseph Priestley also repeated the same experiment and described some of that. And in 1777, Skeel actually reported and published in the Treatise of Fire and Air his preparation of oxygen. And he gets the credit for describing this. So you have a something noble, write it down, tell people you did it, publish it, and because if you did the work, you should get the credit. In this case, there were many other people involved, and like many discoveries, and certainly today, hardly any discovery can be designed for a single individual, since there's so much that requires so many people to get involved. And cancer will be a, a same issue. And for that reason, I bring up to the stage Dr. Don Miller, head of the Cancer Center and Division of hematology, medical oncology and hematology. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, our speaker today um, is one of our outstanding young faculty. Jorge Rios went to medical school at San Marcos University in Lima, Peru, and then went to uh, Pittsburgh, where he did his internship and residency, as well as a hematology oncology fellowship. We were fortunate to recruit him here in 2013 and he has distinguished himself by being a co-investigator on a $3.2 million lung cancer education grant that's very important in this state, obviously. And Jorge uh, is going to talk today about some of the things that non-cancer specialists should know about cancer. Jorge? Thank you, Dr. Miller, for the kind introduction. And thank you for allowing me to present uh, some uh, exciting data that I think uh, uh, I'll be very glad to share with you. And let me just start by telling you that I don't have any disclosures. And also that um, I have uh, certainly two goals today. First, I promise I will not disappoint those of you who are expecting hazard ratio, survival analysis, and proportional hazard models. 
uh, those things that oncologists would like to uh, talk about. And the second thing is that I am going to discuss a topic that is very complex. And my intention is not to uh, do a, a very comprehensive analysis of the problem on cancer, of cancer care in the United States. Rather, what I really wanted to do is to raise awareness on some uh, of the difficulties mainly on some of the progress that we've made uh, throughout these last few years, but also some of the challenges that we are in the um, medical oncology and oncology practice community face uh, uh, looking into the future. And how the, how the, some of the reasons why we're dealing with these uh, difficulties and challenges, and more importantly, how uh, can you guys, uh, primary providers, uh, other non-cancer non specialists can help us to tackle these, these challenges. <clears throat> So they are the learning objectives. And uh, let me start with a clinical scenario so we can, we can start thinking about the questions that I would like to at least touch uh, on today. 76-year-old uh, women admitted to, to the hospital for a persistent common hemoptysis and she ends up uh, being uh, diagnosed with uh, early stage lung cancer. So she had early stage lung cancer with potential curative uh, approaches. She has COPD, diabetic, and peripheral vascular disease and and even though she has uh, this uh, comorbidity burden on diagnosis, she is independent with her instrumental activities of daily living. So some of the questions that we face on a day-to-day -day basis is, um, are we gonna be able to treat this patient safely? And uh, is this lady going to benefit from any therapy that we have available for her? And this is actually a real case because unfortunately this lady made it after the hospital admission to her primary care physician, but um, we never end up seeing a, a cancer specialist, and you didn't see an oncologist or a thoracic surgeon or any uh, cancer specialist. And uh, six months into, into the journey, she came back with uh, more chest discomfort and on restaging scan she saw that she had a locally advanced lung cancer and, her, and therefore her chances of a cure uh, dropped dramatically. So other questions that we think about that is like, what went wrong? And what could we could have done to try to change the course of this lady and, and also at that point in time, can we still safely treat this lady for her condition? <clears throat> so have we made progress in, in the world on lung cancer? My answer on, to, that, to this question would be absolutely. We have uh, made a tremendous progress over the last uh, few years, and that is reflected on the, on the survival of the patients that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. This uh, takes uh, three of the most common uh, solid tumors, and you can see that the survival, uh, uh, five-year survivals have improved significantly uh, 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 from the decade of the 70s until more recently on the 2000s. And this partly has to do with uh, the, the discovery and design and of uh, more innovative and more effective treatments for lung cancer. Uh, this is a slide taken from the ASCO website that shows the landmark practice changing findings that we have uh, uh, reported or it has been reported in, in cancer care over the last uh, several uh, decades. And you can see that uh, there is a, has been a tremendous finding of practice changing uh, uh, interventions over the last, particularly over the last uh, several years. And I have little doubt that this is going to help to continue to take, to tickle that curve upward. However, um, one of the main questions and main challenges that we're facing at this point in time is, are we on, on the right track when it comes to providing quality cancer care? Uh, some, uh, many, many people around the country feel that we are facing a significant challenge at this point in time. For example, the Institute of Medicine uh, was charged by the Department of Health and Human Services in 2013 to analyze the quality of care, uh, of cancer care in the United States. And their conclusion at the end was that the cancer care is a system in crisis. And why do they believe this? They believe this because, uh, number one, the, our population is aging, and is, age, is aging at a very fast pace. It is projected that for the year 2030, the, um, <coughs> the, the, uh, the, proportion, the number of people that are 65 or older are gonna, are gonna be twice what it is, what it was in 2010. Uh, also, we are facing a significant workforce uh, shortages. As you might be aware, it's gonna be an increase in the, a 45% increase in the incident cases of cancer by 20, 2030, but the, um, the number of uh, medical oncologists that are coming out of training are gonna only increase in 28%. 
And that, uh, based on the calculations that the American Society of Clinical Oncology has made, is going to result in about 1,500 uh, physicians uh, deficit uh, across the country. That, uh, with the increase in the cancer cost and the complexity of the cancer care that we're getting at this point in time, and also, importantly, the limited uh, tools when it comes to trying to, to measure improving qualities of, uh, quality of cancer care, uh, all these make uh, th uh, this challenge uh, significant. And in, importantly, in this, in this um, report, the Institute of Medicine made approximately 14 recommendations on the final document. And out of those 14 recommendations, three of them had to do with populations that were not included in the clinical trial settings. As you can see in here, over and over again, the Institute of Medicine recommended that we should look more into those populations that were left out of the clinical trial scenario. And why did it feel this way? It's because there is a significant treatment variability, uh, variability on the treatment patterns of, lung, of cancer in general across the globe and across the disciplines. For example, uh, when, it, when we take the case of prostate cancer, the, um, um, you can see in here that these investigators look into uh, approximately 40 centers across the uh, United States, and they uh, prospectively follow these uh, patients, and, and they reported the, um, the survival and the treatment patterns on those patients that, that had local, local regional prostate cancer. And what they could see is that while young folks uh, certainly receive treatments that, that are known to have the highest yield when it comes to uh, curative intent or, or, ben or survival benefit for prostate cancer, uh, folks uh, older than 75 certainly did, did receive treatments that are not comparable when it comes to efficacy uh, uh, compared to surgery or radiation, for example. And what was, I think, more alarming was that even those folks with high risk prostate cancer that are in, in here uh, represented in this column did receive a significant number of uh, treatments that might not offer the same benefit uh, or not treatment at all. Another point is that in here, for example, the, the, the use of, di of diagnostic brain MRI and PET CTs, um, we, we struggle with costs, uh, as I mentioned to you, but and at the, at the same time, uh, the many practices, uh, unfortunately, uh, the practice, unfortunately, in the United States it doesn't go along with the recommendations from the societies. As you can see in here, even though in the early 2000s, the scientific societies already recognized the lack of use, uh, the lack of benefit from doing PET CTs or brain MRI on early stage breast cancer patients, the number of PET CTs and brain MRI that have uh, been uh, uh, requested for these uh, staging purposes have increased in the United States. Uh, also, there is treatment, there is variability on the, on, on the guideline, um, um, on, on following the guidelines that are uh, proposed by the, the scientific societies. This is uh, taken from a, a registry study from the Sierra Medicare database, and what these uh, investigators looked into is how high was the proportion of those medical oncologists that actually uh, offer treatment according to the guidelines recommended by the American uh, National, Can National um, um, uh, Comprehensive Cancer Network. And they found that um, uh, only approximately 65% of patients receive uh, chemotherapy according with the guidelines for locally advanced um, uh, breast cancer in the, in the setting of adjuvant therapy. And about 10% of them, a little more than 10% of them, didn't receive regimens that were demonstrated to work in these settings. And about one in five patients didn't receive hormonal therapy whenever it was, it was indicated. Now, uh, certainly one can make an argument that uh, there are certain factors that impact this, such as access to care or the potential uh, economical incentive of, of using one or, or, or another therapy. But uh, even in, in institutions such as the Veteran Affairs Administration, when you cannot, uh, you do not have these uh, limitations, we still see significant variability. This investigator, for example, looking to those patients that were eligible for treatment based on the view of medical records over a, a span of uh, two years, and the uh, several institutions on the Veterans Administration's uh, um, institutions. And what they found, uh, both on the, those patients that were eligible for lung cancer resection for early stage lung cancer or treatment for locally advanced rectal cancer either by surgery or by radiation, 
or adjuvant therapy for colon cancer. We, they found that those patients that were eligible were referred to their specialists within the service, but at the end, a significant proportion of patients did not receive treatment. And they, that ranged between 30 and 15% depending on the type of cancer. And um, there, you can make a different arguments about what, why they didn't receive the treatment. They found that the, more, the most common drivers of not receive of therapy was that the patient was uh, deemed to be in poor health or, or too many comorbidities to tolerate treatment or that the patient refused this. But as you can see in here, in, in a significant proportion of patients, there was no apparent reason why patients were not treated. Even if you look at those that were, that were deemed not uh, safe to be treated because of the comorbidities, in the case of lung cancer at least, what they, they found is that um, of all the patients that, that were deemed to be treated and were uh, having significant um, severe COPD or emphysema, half of them actually were treated with surgery and half of them didn't. So those, those are challenging uh, findings that uh, make us think about what is going on here. Um, now, so all this uh, has many consequences, and one of these consequences is under treatment of cancer. This is a large database uh, analysis between 2000 and 2007 from the National Cancer Database that look into patients that are registered in that database regardless of the age, from age zero to until death, and they collected approximately 700, 770,000 patients, and they saw that for patients with stage four diagnosed in that uh, uh, time uh, period, there was a significant proportion of patients that didn't receive treatment. And that was ver that varied according to the, the type of cancer with uh, certainly non, non, uh, lung cancer uh, having a higher uh, rate of non under treatment. Now, our group led by Dr. Clocker did a uh, comparison with what happens in Kentucky. And you can see in here that one by one, except for uh, uh, uterine cancer, the proportion of patients that do not receive therapy for stage four cancer in Kentucky are higher compared to the United States. And that is significant in many of the most common cancer, like you can see in here, significant differences between the US population and the Kentucky population in the non-small non cell cancer, non small cell lung cancer, breast and colon, among others. What is more intriguing is that this is not something that you can um, only analyze by state. If we dig further into this, what we found is that there is a significant variability within hospitals in the same state. This, this uh, is data from the state of Kentucky, and this represents the proportion of patients that were not treated for lung cancer, for stage four lung cancer. And you can see that while there are institutions where, that had about a 10% uh, rate of non-treatment, there are others that are in the range of 60 or 70 percent according to the registry data. So this is certainly a significant variability on the treatment patterns and I think it's a, 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 a fuel for us that are interested in this field to try to identify why this happens. So obviously we need to try to find out why this treatment uh, uh, patterns variability happens and I would argue that one of the ways that we could do that is to look into how oncology providers, medical oncology surgeons and radiation oncologists make treatment decisions. My colleagues would agree with me that uh, we make treatment decisions uh, based on uh, several factors. We factor in socio uh, socioeconomic um, factors. We think about uh, patient preferences. We certainly think about the effectiveness of our, of our treatment. But uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the clinical factors. And I think uh, the, some of the main factors that we take into consideration when it comes to cancer treatment decisions are age, comorbidity, burden on diagnosis, and functional status on diagnosis. So we pay attention to age, we pay attention to comorbidity, burden on diagnosis, and we pay attention to how well our patients are performing. And the problem is that we don't have a very strong data uh, when we are dealing with populations that are not included in the clinical trials. We know that the bulk of our patients with, the bulk of patients who have cancer diagnosis are elders, more than 65. More importantly, the vast majority of patients that die from cancer are older than 65. However, the proportion of patients older than 65 that are included in clinical trials doesn't mirror what happens in real life. You can see in here that the FDA released this data 
uh, on um, registry studies for drug for drug for drug registry purposes, and you can see that um, the proportion of patients or on each uh, age cohort was significantly decreased when it comes to what happened in real life compared to what happened in um, in, in what happened in real life as opposed to what happened in the clinical trial setting. And this varies amongst uh, different types of, can of cancers. Now, when it comes to comorbidities, certainly since we are dealing with an aging population, we acknowledge that there, there has, there more often than not, there are some comorbidities whenever we diagnose patients with cancer. However, the comorbidity burden is different in between uh, cancers and that impacts therapy. This comes from, uh, again, a CIR Medi a Medicare link database analysis uh, or that over a period of five years look into what, uh, what is the comorbidity burden on those patients that are age 66 or older that are diagnosed with cancer. And we found that the breast cancer patients, the, 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 in this, in this uh, graphic, the uh, black uh, portion of the bar represents uh, significant comorbidity burden and the gray a moderate to mild comorbidity burden being or white non-comorbidity burden. You can see that the, the comorbidity burden in lung cancer is significantly higher than breast and, or prostate and that does impact on survival. But we don't have a good understanding of how comorbidities impact our therapies. Uh, as an example, we can see in here that these investigators in Australia look into their uh, cancer registries and they found that one by one, or the cancer, uh, every type of cancer was, uh, or the likelihood of receiving therapy for cancer correlated significantly with the, with the burden of comorbidity that the patients had. But they found some something that was intriguing that, for example, in the case of uh, breast cancer, uh, diabetes was independently associated with the receipt of treatment, whereas that wasn't the case in non-small in cell lung cancer or prostate cancer. So uh, what I'm trying to convey with this is that even though we acknowledge that comorbidity burden is important, we don't have a good grasp of how that affects the, the outcomes of our patients. And those of you, particularly the residents that have, been, uh, that have had a chance to run on our oncology service, we always look at the performance status for making treatment decisions. And certainly that is a very useful tool, but the question is whether, th whether we can use this uh, tool in certain populations, such as the elderly, for example. This is a work from uh, investigators uh, from California and other places that look at how well the performance status prior to chemotherapy correlate with the development of toxicities. And they saw that um, regardless of the performance status on diagnosis, the rate of toxicity, at least in this, uh, this patient population, didn't have any relationship with the performance status on diagnosis. So certainly, as I show you, there are significant um, challenges that we're facing. We are having uh, what the Institute of Medicine describes as a, as, a, as a crisis in the cancer care system, and the challenges are reflected by the treatment uh, pattern variabilities that we observe in our, our, our patient population. What does this have to do with the uh, faculty and, and, and the physicians that are in here? Like I was telling you at the beginning, uh, my in intention is not to dig into the reasons why we, were, we are where we are, but more importantly, to raise awareness. And, and, and I believe it is important for anybody that doesn't treat actively cancer patients to be aware of certain uh, things. For example, it is important to be aware that, that, there, that there are certain factors that we might not be aware of when we are making recommendations as to as I, when it goes, comes to referral or others, but that might be impacting the way we, uh, we advise our patients. This is a study that even though it's slightly old, it's, 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 I believe it's still relevant. It's a study that uh, Dr. Wassenaar and collaborators uh, conducted uh, on a survey on primary care providers uh, across the country. And what they asked them is whether they thought that uh, patients with good performance status or poor performance status might benefit from uh, cancer therapy. And you can see that the good performance status, and they, they asked, they posed questions both on breast and lung cancer. And, and you can see in here that uh, there was a significant proportion of, pay, of, of physicians that thought that patients with good performance status uh, that with advanced cancer might benefit from therapy from them. 
Uh, and likewise, they, there were few of them that thought that, that patients with poor performance status uh, uh, will benefit from cancer therapy. However, when you compare their opinions between breast and, and lung, you can see that there is a significant differences between the recommendations that a primary care provider, or at least the idea that a primary care provider will have in these two diseases. More importantly, um, when they were asked about whether they believe that there was any benefit from chemotherapy, again, on early stage and, and metastatic disease, again, they found that even though they were talking about similar stages of diagnosis, there was a difference between the way the primary provider felt when it, it came from breast cancer compared to when it came from lung cancer. And why is this important? It's because I wanted to also raise awareness on the fact that even in those populations that I've described, even in those elderly folks, even in those patients with high comorbidity, they can still have benefit from treatment. This is a result of, a, again, a large database, a CU Medicare linked database uh, study conducted by the folks at the, at the Dana-Farber, and they looked at the, the survival of patients that are, were 66 or older that received therapy for advanced stage lung cancer. They focused on the elderly population. And they found that after controlling for factors such as um, um, uh, race or level of education of, or, or others, they found that those folks to receive, that receive com, uh, chemotherapy in this population do benefit in terms of survival. They do live longer than those who do not uh, they, they only receive supportive therapy. Now, you can, we can certainly have an argument as to whether appropriate use of supportive therapy might yield better results as compared to chemotherapy, but this reflects what happens in real life. This is not a, a controlled setting. This is results of what has already happened in the day-to-day -day practice. Um, another thing is that when you look at the, at the at the cancer-specific survival. In certain populations, the cancer-specific survival can be significantly similar or, or very similar in different age groups and, and population groups regardless of the other factors. For example, in here, uh, there, there is a, this is a study that I mentioned to you earlier of those 40 centers that had uh, uh, diagnosed, that follow patients diagnosed with locally advanced prostate cancer. And, and what they looked is they analyzed the, survive, the overall survival, all-cause mortality, and they also look into the cancer-specific mortality. And even though on the right side you can see that older folks tend to have a, a worse outcome when it comes to all-cause mortality, when they control for the factors that might drive this other than the cancer diagnosis, they found that the, co the cause-specific mortality, prostate cancer-specific mortality, was fairly similar regardless of the age group. So certainly we oncology providers, we do also face the same challenges that you do. We do also have to make treatment decisions based on the information that we have. And we do also uh, make our treatment decisions based on age, comorbidities, uh, unfortunately many times not knowing that there might be some benefit for those uh, patient populations. And that is reflected on this. This was a survey on, on, on medical oncologists as to whether they, would, uh, whether they would order adjuvant therapy for colon cancer or not, depending on the age, the uh, comorbidity status of the patient. And you can see that even us, medical oncologists, we felt that somebody that is young and has no comorbidity certainly deserves the, the, the benefit of the, uh, of the uh, adjuvant therapy. But the older the patients are and the higher the comorbidity burden on diagnosis, the less likely the provider was to recommend adjuvant therapy. <coughs> Excuse me. I wanted to show you also what we found, and this is data from Kentucky that, um, that I think uh, we are very excited and I think is going to be useful for, for, for a lot of different purposes. Comorbidities is also a, a, a main issue, and we realize that patients that have comorbidities do have a poorer survival than those who don't, particularly when the comorbidity burden is higher. But we found in our analysis of the C Medicare linked database on the folks that were diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer in Kentucky, 
that even those patients with comorbidities do have benefit from, from cancer treatment. You can see, for example, in here, those are the folks that have a stage one uh, lung cancer between 2007 and 2011. We saw that when they don't have comorbidities in here represented by, and are treated, no comorbidities with treatment represented by the brown curve, they fare significantly better than those who have no comorbidities but didn't get treatment. They're represented in here with the green curve. And the advantage, the survival advantage in here was huge, 38 months, 38 months survival advantage. Surprisingly to us that even those folks with significant high comorbidity burden on diagnosis also benefit from cancer therapy. When these folks with high comorbidity were treated, represented in here by the uh, red curve, they also have a significant benefit uh, uh, in terms of overall survival compared to those with high comorbidity that, that did not receive treatment, represented in here by the blue curve. And the difference in overall survival in here was about 14 months. Now, you can argue that comorbidities in, in surgery might not be a factor that is um, uh, on the top of the list when a surgeon is deciding, is deciding or a radiation oncologist is deciding whether you can treat a patient or not. But we found similar results on the, on the more advanced stages when comorbidities certainly impact our decisions when it comes to use of chemotherapy and, and chemotherapy drug selection. In here, for example, again, those who had no comorbidities and received treatment for the stage four in the brown curve fare significantly better than those with no comorbidities that didn't get treated in the green one. And the advantage, um, and the advantage is was approximately four months of overall survival, and it was a very similar advantage uh, when they were actually having a lot of comorbidity on diagnosis represented by the um, red and, and blue curves in here with a very similar 3.7 months in overall survival advantage. Now, there are challenges that we face, and I, I try to, to, them, to show you what are the challenges that we as an oncology practice uh, our as an oncology providers face, but there are also challenges that you guys share with us, and this is a, a, well, an example of them. This is a survey that was uh, sponsored by the NCI and the American Cancer Society. They had a representative sample of all of uh, primary providers and medical oncologists across the country, and they asked them simple questions. They were in, interested in their perception of what is the role in the care of patients that completed uh, treatment for cancer with curative intent. So it's in things such as who takes care of the screen for uh, screening for recurring breast cancer, for example, or who uh, uh, evaluate the long-term uh, treatment effects of breast cancer therapy. And surprisingly, what they found is that there is a discordance between what the primary providers think is happening and what the oncologist thinks is happening, for example. Uh, while the, the um, um, in here the, the bars represent the, the red portion on the bar represent that uh, fem or the perception that the condition is being co-managed, and the green rep um, bar represents that the condition is the physician, whatever wh whether it's a primary provider or an oncologist, is not involved in that particular aspect of the care. Of the care. You can see that while, for example, for screening for recurrent breast cancer why the primary care physicians believe that there was a, a co uh, cohesive, mutual work when it comes to screening for recurrent breast cancer. The proportion of oncologists that felt that that was the case was very, was very different. Importantly too, when they thought that uh, the primary care providers thought that there was a concerted effort in looking into the breast cancer recurrence, the primary oncologists uh, didn't feel that way at all. And if anything, what this, uh, my interpretation of these results is that there is a disconnect between what uh, we think we are doing for our patients in particular and in, in what the other providers are helping us in taking care of these patients think that is happening. More importantly, the communication might not be there. And I think this is, is uh, down the road is gonna be critical for our patients. This happened also in colon cancer patients. Now, what can you as non-oncology providers can do? There are several things that you uh, can do to impact directly, and let me repeat this, impact directly the cancer outcomes on those patients. And I'm gonna show you uh, some of the, uh, at least one of the things that you could do. 
Uh, this is a study that uh, came from the Medical University of South Carolina, uh, or at least was led by the Medical University of South Carolina and conducted in approximately 20 states around the country. And what they look, what they were interested in is we we're looking at, the, at the how the medical oncologists and cancer providers perceive the role was in smoking cessation. And what they found is that um, it was a hands down, there was a significant agreement that a vast majority of um, oncology providers felt that it was important that the patients stop smoking. But only about 42 to 44% of them um, provided cessation support of any kind in their practices. And more important than this, when they were asked who they thought should take charge of the smoking cessation efforts, half of them felt, felt that anybody but them. And this, and why this is important? This is important because smoking is related to not only lung cancer, to a significant large group of cancers. And smoking cessation while uh, your patient is on, under therapy does improve the survival outcomes of them. This is a, uh, an interventional study that was led from, from the folks in New York. And what they did is they identified those patients that were diagnosed with lung cancer and were smoking at the time of diagnosis or within 30 days of the diagnosis. They identified those patients, they got their phone numbers and they follow up with them and they apply an intervention to try to, them, to, try to make them quit smoking. And they analyzed the correlation between the cessation of smoking and the survival of these patients. And at the end, they found that the, there was a significant difference in survival um, between those who stop smoking and those who don't while they are on therapy for lung cancer. And this was independent on age, the independent from age, from comorbidity status and other variables. More importantly, the benefit that they saw on this study was nine months. Dr. Clocker is here. Him and I always talk about uh, immunotherapy and whether we should uh, use one or another drug. And Dr. Miller has been leading many of the studies that uh, resulted in, in, the, in the approval of uh, some of the more exciting, most exciting drugs that we have available at this point, at this point in time. As, a, as, a, as an example, I can tell you, one of the most exciting drugs that we have had in lung cancer, in thoracic oncology over the last 15 years is nivolumab and the survival benefit that, the drug, that that drug offers to our patients is three months. So as I told you, the, the, the um, problem is complex and by no means I try to uh, provide a deep comprehensive analysis of why we are where we are and, 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 what are, and why we have the challenges that we face at this point in time. My main goal was to raise awareness, raise awareness on the fact that we have made progress in, in cancer care in the last few decades. May raise awareness among this audience that we face significant challenges and we are not the only ones that are affected by those challenges in cancer care. Raise awareness also in that even in those populations that are not represented in clinical trials, even those folks do benefit from therapy for, for cancer. And there are certain opportunities that without having the oncologist on the equation, you folks can do to try to help us um, uh, improve the, directly improve the care, the outcomes of our patients with cancer, uh, such as smoking cessation or comorbidity management, aggressiveness on the diabetes management, uh, regardless of the cancer therapy. I wanted to finish uh, this talk with a um, uh, paying tribute to Dr. Gianni Bonadonna. Gianni Bonadonna, it's an Italian oncologist, and many believe that the, many consider him the father of Italian oncology. Um, he's certainly considered by many as a giant in the field. He is the one that took, took uh, the lead on the very initial trials of adjuvant therapy in oncology. Uh, when in the mid 70s, uh, Dr. De Vita and Dr. Canelo de developed the CMF regimen for breast cancer and they tried to test it in the United States. There was no um, surgeons that were very excited about this because they felt that the regimen was, was too toxic. So they, they invited the folks from Italy and Dr. Bonadonna took it upon, upon uh, themselves and 
published the results of the survival of uh, survival advantage, progression-free survival advantage of adding adjuvant therapy and open the, the field of adjuvant therapy in oncology. Certainly, a lot of people feel that he passed away uh, exactly 10 days from, from today, and many people feel like his contributions are invaluable. I had the chance to um, not meet him personally, but actually being trained uh, by people that uh, work closely with him. And I have been able to nurture from some of the, of the uh, teachings that he had. And one thing that's surprising about him is that even though he is, a, he is or was a very data-driven person, one of his, um, my, my favorite quotes from him is that don't get too caught in, in the deluge of data and statistics. Time to reconnect with the patient. So with this, I wanted to thank you for your attention and open the podium for any questions that you might have. Absolutely. So, as, as you said, that, that study, I believe you are referring to the one that, uh, that put the bars in between the breast and lung, and, and that was a, a perception, and that perception is driven by what we have at that time. That, uh, that study was published in 2007, and it was conducted between 2002 and 2006. And, and so at that point in time, unfortunately, lung cancer that was, uh, didn't have the, 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 uh, the agents that we have, and breast cancer had so many agents at, the, at, that, at that point. Um, however, uh, so I, I agree with you in that uh, there are some factors that might have uh, influenced the recommendations from primary physicians as to, or at least the perceptions from primary physicians. But what I wanted to point out too is that with this data that I, I have presented, my intention was not to convey the measures that you should treat anybody regardless of whether they are sick or not. No, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that there are some situations when treatment might be beneficial, that we don't understand very well how much comorbidity affects the treatment, and we, at the very minimum, I believe, should give the benefit of the doubt to our patients and send this patient to somebody that can have, that have a little bit more experience to try to see if there's something available for them. Lori. Thank you for your question. So what we've done is at this day and age, we're, we're, this is a an ongoing effort, but at, up until this point, we've looked at, at uh, what happened in the past in patients that were diagnosed between 2007 and 11. And when we analyze the data of those um, on that group of patients, we consider factors such as geographic origin, metropolitan areas versus rural areas. We consider factors uh, such as uh, Appalachian region origin versus non-Appalachian region origin poverty, we will consider educational level, and to our surprise, none of them were actually associated with the odds of receipt of lung, can uh, lung cancer therapy. None of them. So uh, the challenge for our study group at this point in time is dig more into that, look into what uh, smoking cessation could do, and see why uh, our patients are not getting the same uh, results uh, in treatment for, uh, than, than is uh, given in the other parts of the United States. Yes, actually, they, they have, and they, they have been reports 
on breast cancer in particularly and, and the, the type of regimen that the physician use and the, and the type of uh, uh, supportive care that the physician use and they have seen differences between those physicians that were trained prior to 1980 and those who were trained after 1980, at least in, in that uh, study group. So that is also another factor to, to take into consideration. <laughs> yes. That, that is an interesting question. I have to confess that I have no, I don't know whether, whether that has been studied or not. I don't know if you get no. Yes, please. And with me too, I remember you. So that's a, um, that Dr. Clocker actually conducted a, a, a survey across the state and he found that uh, that the nihilism was, was important in our state. Not sure whether I have any um, data to compare um, what happens in, in Kentucky uh, compared to the rest of the, of the population, but uh, the only thing I can tell you is that based on, on Getz um, data, that there, there is this, the nihilism in, in Kentucky is significant, towards lung cancer in particular. Okay. I blame it on L scripts. So across the country, what uh, what they're looking into right now is to try to come up with different uh, curves of model. And the one that it's, uh, because of the aging population that we have, the one that has been explored the most is what we call cancer care home or cancer home. And, and what, it, what it is, is basically bringing together primary providers, particularly geriatricians and, and oncologists uh, in, a, in a combined model so they can actually have access to the same type of information on a real time basis. Uh, the challenges of that is what we what we actually experience in here. You guys use a different system than us, and I'm sure you never see my notes because you don't have access, access them, even though I send them to you. Uh, but uh, but uh, the, that, that is a challenge that it's one of the things that we also want to tackle with this uh, grant that we have uh, that where Dr. Clocker is PI. Yes. I completely agree with you, and um, I really thank you for bringing that up. Part of our work uh, with uh, treatment patterns in Kentucky was to conduct a survey on primary care providers across the state of Kentucky. And we found from your colleagues across the street, from every, re every single corner of Kentucky, what you're saying, that patients, one of the challenges that patients have when they are not in Louisville, when they're only five minutes away from the Brown Cancer Center or the Baptist Disease Hospital, is that they, whenever they develop toxicities, there's no way for them to get to whoever is gonna be able to help them. That even if they don't develop toxicities, they don't feel like 
go in there and they need somebody to take them, but they just don't have the resources to do that. So uh, absolutely, th th there are so many challenges and, and we're in so many things that uh, I think we need to address that um, it is important for us to try to at least have a, a, a uh, what what gets uh, calls a high definition idea of what's going on right now and try to tackle it one by one. Hopefully, uh, many of you will be excited and interested about this and we're, ho we're, we're very happy to bring you guys into on board to try to tackle one of these issues. Thank you. Thank you.